let's get this thing started, shall we? I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. And I'm going to be working today in Photoshop because, well, if, let me back up a little bit. Uh, we're looking at Nick's the Nick Collection 2, which includes now DxO's Film Lab. We're not going to be working out of there though today because every time I jump into a filter, it has to generate that TIFF file. So it takes a little bit longer. And I've got a bunch of different photos that I want to bounce between as I show different filters. So as you can see on my screen now, what I've done is I've opened up six pictures. These are all raw files open to smart objects inside of Photoshop so that I can more quickly jump back and forth. But of course, once we're in the plugin, the workflow is identical. It doesn't matter what app you're coming from. So with that said, said I will start with this picture here also I've got this uh, it's called the selective tool palette it's kind of funny this is one of those things that most people go how do I get rid of this because it's just this annoying palette that opens up every time you launch Photoshop this palette just to quickly kind of show you what this is it's just a preset launching palette for the plugins not all the plugins but some of them and it includes starting points or recipes for a lot of these honestly most people don't ever want this here I never use it uh, to get rid of it. You can just close it right here, but you, if you, well, let me do this. I'll go ahead and close it. That gets rid of it. If you want to bring it back, you go to the file menu and it's under automate Nick collection selective tool. The only reason that I'm actually using it today is to make it a little bit quicker to get into ColorFX Pro. There's a one button launch here instead of every time having to go up to the filter menu. Oh, I have to actually select the layer first, going to the filter menu and choosing the filter here so it's just I, i'm just using this as a shortcut uh most of you probably want to get rid of this just close that little checkbox and it, and it won't come back so let's go ahead and jump in with this picture here and we'll start with a brief tour of colorfx pro itself just in case you're completely new to this to show you how you go about uh using the tool and then of course we're going to go through all those different filters so here's the layout on the left hand side we are first looking at the filter library. We are currently looking at all filters. You can see all the different filters you have to choose from here, but there are categories in here that are already created for you. These are just filtering, the filters, if you will, ones that are kind of designed more for landscape or that somebody believes that someone editing a landscape photo might want. If you're editing wedding photos, you might want these. If you're doing architecture, you might want these and, and so on. So this allows you to, especially when you're newer to the app and you don't necessarily know what all the different tools do to more quickly find something that might be appropriate for the photo that you're working with. But I'm going to stick in, stick with all here so that I can, uh, so that I have access to all of them. Also, you'll notice that some of these have a little yellow star next to it. These are marking as favorites and you'll see up here in the filter that I do have a favorites collection. So this allows me to personally identify the ones that I like best mark this as a favorite and then just filter those. And you can see that I've already done that in here. I've marked off the ones that I personally like, the ones that I use the most. Um, again, personal opinion doesn't mean that they're the best or the worst. It's just, it's just what I like. Down here, we have all these different filters. We will, of course, be spending our time going through those. Underneath that, you see this thing called recipes. And if I click on that, these are existing recipes. And for any of you who have seen the webinars leading up to this one, you've probably already seen this. These are collections of different types of presets that are already in here. And if we create our own presets or recipes, which we are going to do, and then this is where they're going to show up. You also have down here a history palette to show you where you've gone. So you can go back and kind of go back in time if you want to in there. Uh, up across the top, you have a preview window. So well, you can, first of all, you can hide the filter thing if you want to. Um, this preview is a split preview or a side-by-side -side preview. So you can see a before and after of what you're working on. You can also press and hold the compare button. And it's important to note that it's a press and hold. If I just click it, it doesn't really do anything. You press and hold that and you see the original versus what you're working on. Over here, you've got a zoom button, a, a one touch to get you into 100% and that brings up the navigator so you can easily pan around and then zoom back out again. You'll probably use this quite a bit, especially if you're doing anything with grain or sharpening. You're going to want to make sure that you are zooming into that photo 100% quite often. So that's a, a quick one to get to. And you do have different zoom presets in here. And you can use your command plus and minus if you want to in there as well. You can change the background color if you want to. I just always leave it as gray. You can hide the palette on the right. But then, of course, you can't do anything. So you probably aren't going to hide that too often. And then over here on the right, we see the filters that we're working with. And this is a really, really important thing to understand about how Color Effects Pro works. So let's start by, well, I'll just, I've got this one filter that's applied by default. It's called Photo Stylizer. And I'll go over here on the left and I'll click on black and white conversion. And the photo's obviously going black and white. And I look over here on the right and it says black and white conversion. Okay, cool. And I go over here and I click on another one, dark contrasts. And that's horrible. Um, it's done this dark contrast that's here. But the previous one, the black and white conversion is gone. 
So super, super important. This, what you're looking at here, we refer to as a filter holder. And if I click on any filter over here on the left, it replaces the one on the right. If I want to add an additional filter, which is of course the real power of this, stacking these filters together, then I first have to click on add filter right here. When I add filter, it adds a new empty filter holder. And now when I add another filter to it, we have multiples in here and we can keep going, right? I can just keep going and adding another filter in here and adding another filter in here. And I can build this up however I like. And then once I've come up with something that I like, well, I, I can just hit okay and render this out for this one image. Or if I wanna save that as a recipe, then I click on the save recipe button here. I can give that a name and away we go. So super, super important thing to understand about how this works, that you have to add a filter holder before you can add another filter to it. Once you've got these effects in here, you can rearrange these. So I could take this by color user to find that I just added and I could say, you know what, this will be better if I move it to the top of the stack. And it's very important to understand that this, the effect is cascading. So if, for example, let me, let's do this. Let me reset a few of these. And by the way, that little X box right there will just delete the filter that's there. So I've got an empty filter in there. Let me add a black and white and then add a, I don't know what's a good, uh, Need a good color one. Let's do a, we're gonna add a filter first. Let's do a bicolor on top of that. Okay, so I've got black and white and then a bicolor filter. So it has first converted it to black and white and then added a bicolor. If I move the bicolor before the black and white, then it has, let me turn off the black and white. It has first made it bicolor and then added a black and white. So probably not much of an advantage here. So if I'm trying to add the bicolor to a black and white image, right? I wanna desaturate it and then add colors to it. It's very important that I pay attention to the order. I have to have the black and white first and then the bicolor. So just really important to understand that the image path goes from top to bottom here. It passes through one filter and then hands it off to the next one. And this is very powerful to understand. So for example, on a photo like this, if you wanted to, uh, actually we're gonna run into this in one case, we're gonna, have her lip, we're gonna do something where her lips are gonna go almost completely black. And so that's no good, so I need to lighten them up. And if I added a lightning filter after it, it would be lightening the almost black pixels as opposed to adding it before. So it lightens the good, uh, clean pixels, lightens those more so that the effect that is added to it, that is there darkening them, is not uh, is darkening the brighter pixels as opposed to brightening the dark ones. That make any sense? You'll, you'll see it more when we get into it, but very important to understand that the they have the um, the path in here. Uh, let's see here. Also under here to understand is there's this little reset button that's right next to the X to clear it out. You'll see you have a couple things in here. You can copy your control points. So if you're new to control points, we'll explain those a bit as we go in here, but you can copy the control points so that you can then paste them to another filter. You can reset the filter and keep your control points. So if you spend some time building up control points and working on a filter and you go, you know, I just want to start this filter over again, but I don't want to lose my control points. That's what you do. And then reset filter and delete just as a complete reset of the filter, deleting your control points as well. Finally, down at the bottom, you'll see there's a loop and histogram view. We can open that up and this allows us to see up close to whatever we're working on. And if we uh, hover over here, you can click between loop and histogram. So if you want that to be a histogram view instead, you can have that up as well. Um, and that's, I guess, about it. Let's go, we can go ahead and close that. I'm going to leave that closed for now. And I do believe that that is everything on the basic tour. Oh, oh, one more thing I'll show you. Down here in the bottom left corner, there's a help button. If you uh, click that, it opens up this web page, which doesn't seem to have a whole lot of info on it. However, if you open up filters here and then you click on view page here, now you get into a description of every single filter that's in here. And this can be quite handy because if you're looking at a filter and you just can't quite figure out what it's doing or why a slider is interacting with the way that it is, this can be a great way to get a bit more understanding behind what's happening in there. What I would do is, so let's just say that I was working in here. Let's go back to Photoshop. Let's say that I was working in uh, bleach bypass. I'm going, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around it. I don't understand what's happening. And incidentally, I'll say that quite often, if you can't quite figure out what's happening, it's simply because the image that you're using isn't really taking advantage of an effect, right? It's not, an effect is really designed, that effect you might be working with might be designed for a different type of image. And so it's just not really doing anything good for your image. And you're like, well, what's the point of this? So then if you go over here and we go into the web page, and I'll just do a quick find on the page for bleach bypass. And I go, okay, bleach bypass. Now I can read about it. I can understand. I go, oh, okay, I get it now. Now I know what's happening. 
and so on. So just a very, very handy thing to have in there. And, and I'm going to leave this open because I might actually reference it at some point throughout today. All right, with all that said, let me take a quick look at the questions, see if there's anything popping up, and then we're going to dive on in. Um, Kate saying all good from North Carolina, and Edwin saying, say again on not losing the control points. Yeah, so if you are, if you want to reset a filter, so let's just say that I've added, this is a horrible example here, but we're going to do it anyway. Let's say I've added a control point to her face on there and um, done, you know, whatever I've done to this image. And I go, you know, I want to reset this filter, but not lose the control points. If you go and drop down on this menu here, you can reset and keep the control points. So it keeps it. So if I hit reset here, it resets everything, but the control point is still in place. Or I can go in here and say reset and delete the control points, in which case it does a complete reset of the entire filter. All right, excellent. Thank you for asking that. And again, ask questions at any time. I'll be jumping into the questions quite often. All right, so let's start going through these. Um, we're gonna start with the first one, black and white conversion. A lot, I, again, I'm not going to go deep into each one of these because we would be here for hours and hours and we want to get into building these, but black and white conversion, pretty straightforward. It's doing a black and white conversion. I'll tell you personally, if I'm going to do black and white, I'm doing it in SilverFX Pro, so I never use the one in here. But if you wanted to do it, if you're already in here, if you want to do black and white, you can. And you can see there are some different types of black and white conversions that you can choose from in here. Um, by color filters, we'll go to this one next. Now, you'll notice as I hover over each one of these that there is a little icon next to it and if you click on this little icon it opens up presets for that filter now this is super super useful because you can go through here and without taking the time to apply uh to apply a filter and drag around and see exactly what it would try to figure out what it would do or try to figure out what options it might have you can look in here and see an instant preview with your image of what these what this filter is capable of and it, it's it's obviously not everything that it's capable of, but it's showing you some presets. So you go, okay, buy color filters, and you look through here, and I can just scroll down and go, oh, okay, I can see some, some kind of interesting things that this will do. And of course, if I click on one of them, then it's going to apply it on here. So buy color filter is simply a color gradient, and you have a series of color, preset color gradients in here that is running from top to bottom, and then there's different ways in which it blends together. So for example, uh, I'm gonna take the opacity way up, so it's a little bit easier to see what's happening in here, and I can blend from the top to the bottom of this preview, and you can kind of see that blend position changing in there, shift the vertical position of that. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's, it's a pretty heavy wash on it. Um, you'd probably back it off pretty heavily there just to give it a little bit of a color wash over an image. But this one, you're working with preset colors. There are ones that allow you to define the colors as well. Also, once you're in this mode, once I'm in the preset mode, you'll see up here at the top, there's a little up and down button that just jumps to the next filter. So this, again, is a really great way to get to know the tool. To go through here and instead of um, instead of just clicking on one of these and dragging the sliders around to try and figure it out, if I go into here and start with the presets and just jump to the next preset, and I see now that it's by color user defined. So remember the previous one was by color filters. They weren't user defined. There are kind of some presets in there. Here, by color user defined, um, and there's still our presets, but I can see some ideas of what's in here and then go in and totally control it. So here, if I wanted to do a color shift, let's say I've got a landscape and I want to do, um, and well, let's, let's, let's do this. Let me cancel this picture and we'll open up, um, how about this one here? Open this guy, go into the filter. I'll add a by color user defined filter and then we'll do a gradient, color gradient over this landscape in here. So I'll jump into this. There's all these different presets in here that I can choose from. And uh, that's kind of terrible. Let's try kind of the brown pink. I kind of like this like pinkish on the on the sand in there. And you can see on here, this is where I would change the color of the sand and I can choose, it's just standard matte color picker. Unfortunately, it doesn't update in real time as you drag this around. The color doesn't change until you close it. Uh, it's something I hope that we'll see an enhancement for in the future, uh, but let's, uh, let's, I kind of liked the pink that was on there actually. So let's go ahead and apply that again. A little bit of a pink wash to the sand. And then maybe the sky, I'll actually add blue onto that. Let's make it a richer blue than it already is. And here I can you know, take the intensity up on that, or the opacity rather, change my blend position on there, the vertical shift, uh, where it's making that transition and so on. So nice little color color cast to apply over this thing. Uh, next one is bleach bypass. This one is a, a mimicking of an old film effect where you skip the bleaching step of processing film, hence the bleach bypass or bypassing the bleach. And what that did was it left the silver on the on the negative and that just gave it a completely different look. Um, probably a little bit more, well, actually it kind of works in here. Um, 
you can kind of see some of the effect. It tends to desaturate it a bit, uh, add some contrast to it, and depending on the image, it can it can be kind of a cool effect. Actually, it's it's a pretty common old common like kind of an old film effect that you might have seen uh, in kind of in some older movie type of things, like maybe a flashback scene or something like that. Um, it's a good way to kind of just make the scene look different. But anyway, I, again, you have up here different sliders in here, so change the overall brightness of this, saturation of it. And this is a good one to go in and say, well, what, what exactly is bleach bypass? So you go in here and you read it, simulates the technique used with color film, which bleach step was skipped, see, just like I told you, um, resulting in a high contrast, low saturation effect. Okay, okay, so you start to get it, see what the different sliders do and so on. Uh, next one in here is brilliance and warmth. Now brilliance and warmth is a very simple one. You look over here on the right, you've got a little brightness, saturation, contrast in here. So no special effecty type stuff. This is really just a corrective effect. This to me is a really important one because a lot of the different filters through here will do things to your colors that you may not want. Uh, maybe they cool it or warm it too much or they under or over saturate it. This is a nice way to kind of insert another step in there to just fix that color cast. So I've actually marked this one as a favorite. You go back to brilliance and warmth you see here that I've marked it. It's actually the first one that I've marked as a favorite because it's something that I would use pretty often in there. Um, and of course, if you just use it on here, you can see the you know, just simple presets, brilliance and warmth, um, saturation and warmth, if you will. Classic soft focus. I really like this one. Let me let me jump into a portrait picture again for this one. Uh, this classic soft focus is quite nice. It it adds that that gentle softness to it without making it blurry. There's a difference between a blurry picture and a um, soft focus picture. Uh, the soft focus tends to have just a little bit of a glow to it, very subtle, very gentle, but it can be a nice effect. So if I go back into classical soft focus in here, we'll pull up some of the presets. You can see how if I do a before and after, it's adding that nice soft glow to this. And there's actually another glow filter that I think is very nice as well. Uh, slightly different approach to it, but if you want to add that portrait glow, if you're doing a uh, maybe a bridal picture and you want to have that real kind of ethereal, nice soft dreamy look to it, um, this one and then the other soft focus one we'll look at later is another, uh, are great tools for that. So this is the kind of thing where learning the tool, spending some time in there, builds up in your head what is possible within the tool within the plugin and then uh, when you're in here you, you know oh yeah i can do that soft focus thing find it play with the different ones and see what works for that particular image so there's different soft focus methods in here you can see in here you can just try different ones there's no real explanation of what the different ones are it's more just try them and see what works for your particular photo and, and going through the different presets in here will change that as well you can see the number here if i go to the first one it's on number one um this one goes to number three that one's number one again i think this one's well, that was number three as well so it just gives you some some quick access to try the different things so again just a very nice quick easy way to do it so like this particular picture i would say like the generic soft focus is a little hot on your forehead obviously i could dial that back but that's happening the strong soft focus is a little bit too flat for my taste. Um, diffusion, not really digging that one, but the strong diffusion, like this one I really like. Uh, you know, maybe it's a bit much, so I can dial it back a little bit, but I, I quite like it. Strengths all the way up to 90%, to dial it back just a little bit in there, and I kind of like it. So I think I've marked this one as a favorite as well. Yeah, I have, because I, I do quite like that one. Uh, color stylizer, so this one is, it's adding a color wash over the entire image. No gradients, so similar to the bicolor gradients that we had, except that it's not a gradient, it's just a single color. And again, you see different presets in here, and basically you're just adding a single color on top of the image. This would be really effective if you added black and white before it. And I think we might have already, might have stacked these two together already. Um, if you add a black and white one and then add a sapia on top of it, then you're gonna get a, probably a more effective sapia type look or, or a cyanotype type look than if you added it on top of the color image. So good, good example here of how to, um, how to stack the filter. So in that case, let's say that I wanted to do that. Let's say I wanted a good clean sapia image. Uh, let's go ahead and add a black and white to this. So I'll click on add filter, go back, do a black and white conversion, drag that before it, right? Because remember right now I'm coloring it and then making it black and white. Let's move this up on top of it. So now I've got a black and white conversion with the color stylizer on top of that. And at this point I could look at that and go, well, it's a little bit too high contrast. So maybe I'll take the contrast down on the black and white conversion. But of course I'm looking at the entire stack. So let's pull that down a little bit. Uh, let's see here, maybe it's a little bit too sapey. I don't want it quite so rich in color. So I'll back that off a little bit. I just want a little hint of that, of that color on there. Um, pull that down a little bit more and something like that and good and i go you know what i like this i like it so i'm going to go ahead and save that as a recipe recipe so i click save recipe 
and I'll call it uh, my sapia look, hit OK, and it immediately opens up the preset area for me, the, uh, the recipe area for me, so I can see the one that I've just added. And you can see there's one that I added earlier called hot contrast, click on that and it loads up that preset. I can go back to my sapia look and add that in there as well. Um, so while we're in here, a couple other things that you have, if you want to delete a preset, there you go, delete that. Um, this is a, an export button, so you can actually export your recipes, your presets, which is super handy for moving to other computer systems. Uh, you, you can put them in your Dropbox so that you can access them from anywhere. You could share them. You could put them up on your website for download. You could sell them if you wanted to. But, you know, no restrictions there. You can do whatever you like. So that's kind of a neat thing to do. And then there's this refresh. So if you let's say that I've done this and I go, you know, actually what I want to do, I want to change this up a little bit. Um, so add a little more contrast in there more saturation to that and I go okay that's actually the better look that I like now I go in here and I update the preset it says are you sure yes I am and it now updates the preset with the new settings in there okay all right let's go back let's actually go into the filter library again let's just get rid of these two and move on uh, let's see here that was color stylizer let's go to colorize next and let me take a quick look in the Q&A see if there's anything in here Nope, no new questions. Again, just a reminder in case you just joined us, ask questions at any time. I'll be jumping into those questions pretty often throughout. Okay, so Colorize is next. This is another one that's kind of weirdly not really easy to uh, to predict what's going to happen type of ones. You have methods of doing the color effect. There's these presets, the pick. What is that? I don't even know what this, I never quite understood what this preset is. It looks like, or what the uh, example in the preset looks like a photo of some tomatoes or oranges. I don't really know what it is, but it's just showing different presets. It's like tiniest little method example. Anyway, so you can, you really would just have to go through and try these. There's no way to know exactly what each one is going to do. So you just try these different ones and, um, and you can see some of these are, are pretty dramatic, some of them are a bit more subtle in there. And uh, of course, as with everything, you want to dial the strength back a little bit. You can change the color on this if you wanted to. Uh, and away you go. So just kind of a color, adding color on top of it. And again, you could do this on top of a black and white as well. Contrast color range. All right, so this is gonna add contrast into specific color ranges of the photo. So you can see the presets, red, yellow, green, blue, magenta. So if we go to yellow and green in here, it's basically adding contrast into that color range, into that green color range. Kind of handy, um, not one I really use that much, but there it is. Contrast only. This one is a pretty heavy-handed contrast tool. There's a pro contrast that we're going to look at later that is actually really, really good. So I got to say, I don't think I've ever really used this one, but you can go through and you see it's it's just a basic contrast tool. Um, brightness and contrast in here. It can be handy. And you know, actually, I, I shouldn't say I never used it. I think I've actually marked this one. Um, yeah, I have marked this one as a favorite because it is a good way to just enhance the contrast or take out the contrast a little bit on an image where a filter has done too much to it. So it's just kind of a very generic tool, but it can be good like that um, hue and was it the brilliance and warmth one. It's a good way to, to go do a little bit of correction um, after some other filter has done too much to an image or not enough as the case may be. All right, cross balance. This one is about doing a, a cross processing effect from, uh, not cross processing, sorry, cross color balance effect, or white balance effect. There's what I was looking for, white balance. So you can see here daylight to tungsten or tungsten to daylight conversions. And again, the presets here will um, you know, show you very quickly what it'll do. So if you have something, I mean, if you are if you shot something in tungsten white balance accidentally and you were in daylight, then of course you were gonna fix that in white balance before you get into the filter. But this is a way to, ha to add it as a bit of an effect. Not one I really use, but um, but there you go. It's there if you want it. Cross-processing, okay, this is what I was trying to explain earlier. This is the one where it's a film cross-processing type. So the idea here, if we look at the methods, is you have two different categories, C41 to E6 and E6 to C41. Those are chemical processes. C41 was what was used for color negative film, and that's the negatives that you would make prints from. And then E6 is the processing for color positive film. That's your slides or your chromes. These are simulating the effect if you took one type of film and developed in the, in the other type of chemical. And they're kind of neat. You can get some pretty cool effects out of these. I'm like this one here, I think is really, really nice. It's a really interesting effect. And uh, it's very, very Instagrammy, if you will. Um, it just adds this kind of quite, quite a unique color shift, color twist to it, uh, to the image. Certain colors go certain directions, um, and they're not all the same. It's not like everything's just a hue rotation. Different colors go get treated in different ways. It can be kind of a fun effect. It's, it's one that I, I will jump into pretty often if I'm looking to create some kind of an old film 
look. This is something that'd be really powerful to combine with an actual film preset where you can choose a film stock, add film grain, and then add this on top of it, you could very much get a filmic type look to it. In fact, why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? Now, I wasn't planning on doing that yet, but let's just do that. So I've got this cross process. I'm going to add a new filter in here. I'm gonna jump back and I know I've got it set in my favorites. I've got Film Effects Modern. So let's go to this one. Now, here's something that's really neat about these uh, presets in here. Uh, the, yeah, the presets, the previews of the presets, these are actually showing you the presets with everything else already combined. So this, what you see on the left here, is going to change depending on what you've done on the right, which is kind of neat. Let me put this film effects before the cross-processing. And so now we are seeing the effect before the cross-processing because I've moved it before that in the stack. Um, and this will allow me to choose a different film type. So let me actually hide the cross-process um, go through the different film sets in here. And I personally really like the look of old film. I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm, I've am i been doing this for a long time. I, I used to shoot film. I love the look of film. I also, and anybody who's watched my stuff before, probably heard me say, I feel that a lot of digital is it's too clean. It's too sharp. It's I feel like it's a bit soulless. I like having a little bit of grain. I like having a little bit of um, not grunge. I'm not like looking to make my pictures look like they were left in the dirt overnight, but but just having a little bit more texture to them, I personally really like. So it's pretty common for me to go in and add some kind of a basic film effect. And so I might go in here and even just start with the default and then choose a different film type in here. So uh, let's do like, a, I don't know, Kodak Gold, pretty common one, add that into there. Uh, maybe add a little uh, little extra grain so I can open up the film, open up the detail, not the grain, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that later. Um, that it's, it is in there, film details. I want, to, I want to spend some more time in this one later. I want to do this right now, but here's here's the grain. I can add a little more grain into there, and then let's close that up and go to, uh, where are we? Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. There it is, cross-processing. Turn that on, and now I've added this cross-processing on top of that film effect, and it looks pretty good. Now, this fact, I go, you know, it's probably a bit too saturated, so hey, great. Let's add another filter, go back into my favorites, and... Um, we'll use the brilliance and warmth on there to just desaturate it a little bit because there's a little bit too much in there. And there we go. Or, ooh, this is good. Let's let's use this to uh, to show off the control points. So let's say looking at this image, I think the colors overall, the contrast is great. Actually, maybe it's a little bit too high contrast. Let's go back into the film effects and change the contrast on. I'm going to get more into the film details than I really wanted to now but just pretend you're not seeing this. I'm just gonna lift up the shadows a tiny bit because I wanna come back in here and spend some more time in this in a moment. Uh, let's go back now to the brilliance and warmth. Okay, so I like the overall colors of this. I like the contrast, but her lips are just a little bit too red, a little bit too much on there. So I wanna desaturate her lips just a little bit more. This is where the control points are gonna come in handy. Now I need the overall saturation reduction that's on this image. I need that there. So I'm gonna add another brilliance and warmth and now I'm going to add a control point just to her lips. So let's grab this and click on her lips here. And if you've not seen this before, let me give you a little bit of a tour of how control points work. So for those of you who've never seen this before, if you've seen this, if you've seen control points before, you know how they work, then take a breath. Um, the idea behind control points is you are creating a mask in real time without having to do any type of selections to do your mask or any type of path drawings to do your mask. You are creating a mask based off of the luminance and chrominance. That's the brightness and the color of the pixels that you clicked on. So I've clicked on her red lips and this is now going to create a mask that is going to highlight just her red lips. Now, depending on the variation in the lips and we can see on here, if I zoom in to 100%, that there's quite a bit of variation there, right? We've got uh, kind of dark, Let's, go, let's call it a middle part on the bottom lip, a bit darker on the top, and then there's the highlights in there. So it's not all the same. So this one control point is probably not going to get all of her lips, but let's find out. And the way that you find out is by showing the mask. This little tool right here shows the mask, and I can see in here what is being selected. So the white is selected, black is not. Anything that's a shade of gray is partially selected. So I can change the size of this area of influence. I really only want to affect her lips in there. And I can see that it is not affecting everything. So I'm going to hold on the option key and drag this little control point to add another one. 
and it looks like I might even need a third one in there. And now I've done a, I should even add a fourth one up to the top of her lips. And I've, I've really done a good job of isolating her lips, but I've gotten too much of the surrounding area as well. So now you have a negative control point I can click to add, and now I can protect an area. So now I'm protecting the rest of her face, that area under her nose, this even goes as far as protecting the hair in there. And now I've created this almost perfect mask around her lips. Now that I've created that mask, any effect that I add to this, which is going to be a desaturation effect, is only going to affect her lips. So let's take the saturation, pull that down a little bit. And you can see if I take it all, just to exaggerate, I'll take it all the way down. You can see her lips have gone black and white, obviously not what I wanted. Pull that down just a little bit in there and away we go. Perfect, right? So I dig that. And then of course I can now save this as a, um, as a recipe in there. So we'll save that and we'll call this, um, I don't know, we'll call this film look uh, recipe 49, recipe 49. Why 49? I have no idea. Save that off and there we go. So now I've got my, uh, where are we, custom presets and um, and there's my new film look recipe 49. Fantastic. All right, so this is how the recipes come together. You start working on something, you get an idea, you want to evolve it, you go and um, and look for the, the next step of that. You find that doing that step creates an idea for another step or makes you makes you think, oh, I really need to add this to desaturate it, add the contrast, pull some out, whatever it might be, and eventually build it up to create the look that you like. It's kind of fun, right? Uh, let me jump into the questions real quick, see if there's anything that's popped up in here. Kate, can you use a control point to remove the applied effect to one area of the image? I believe that I have just answered that question for you, Kate. If uh, if not, then let me know and I will uh, I will I will answer that again. Um, also a reminder in case you missed the very beginning, I do want to make this a bit more interactive as well, meaning that as I get through these filters, I would love to hear ideas from you guys on what you want to see, and I will try to create a look based off of your um, your idea, your concept. My gosh, we're half an hour in already, so I've got to get to work here. All right, um, we're going to trash all this and just keep on going through the filters. All right, back to the filter library, back to all, and where was I? I was on uh, cross balance, cross processing. There we was. Okay, dark contrast. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna fly through these. Dark contrast is just adding some contrast into the really dark areas of the image. Uh, for a portrait, it's horrible. You can see that, but it's adding contrast in the dark areas. Dark and light and center. This is kind of like a vignette, but it's a very, very subtle one. And I actually quite like it. I like this more than using vignette a lot because it is so gentle and it just allows you to brighten up the center, darken the edges just ever so slightly in a very, very nice sort of way. If we can do a compare here to the original, you can see it's very subtle, very gentle, and it both brightens the center and darkens the edges on there. So I quite like that. Uh, detail extractor. Let's use a different picture for this. Let me cancel out of this one. And uh, whoa, did I quit? How did that? Oh no, that's no good. Um, somehow I quit Photoshop, or it crashed. <laughs> Maybe the case as well. Which means my six photos that were open are no longer there. Uh oh, well, see, Abby. What a great time to answer any questions that might have come up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Kate is saying thanks repeatedly. You're welcome repeatedly. All right, back into Photoshop. Ooh, is it gonna actually open everything for me? Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, yes, it's opening them all. It must have crashed, how bizarre. Okay, I'm just gonna sit back and let it open two of them. <laughs> Thanks, Photoshop, you only opened two of them. Oh yeah, look, recovered, recovered. Ah, oh, man, okay. I know which one I wanted anyway. I wanted the elephant, which was here. Open up my elephant picture in here. And, Let's see here, this was, these are all open as objects. So let me just get this open again real quick. And let's see, what have I got? I've got that one, that one. I'm gonna need my portrait picture, which is, which is, which is, which is, I think it's that one. I don't know why it doesn't have a preview, but I think that's the one. Yep, that's it. Open object. And one more, which was the coffee picture, which now that I, I may not actually use, but we're gonna open it anyway. Because if I don't have six open, then I can't do a nice six layout. What's going on here? Oh, there it is. Uh, open object and, okay. Window, arrange. Oh, I just said I don't have six open. What am I missing? Um, sorry about this, folks. Did not expect that to crash. Uh, which picture am I missing? I got her, I got that. Oh, I opened the model twice. Well, that's brilliant. Oh, well, whatever. You know what? We're not going to worry about it. I will figure it out as I go. Let me just do a four up arrangement and that will have to do. And we are using the elephant picture. 
good enough. Okay, Elephant, let's go. Let me bring up that palette again. Automate the uh, collection selective tool. Oh, right, and I told you, I told you that this allows me to, uh, as you saw, hide this tool by closing it. I neglected part of that. If I close this, it's going to automatically open up the next time again. If you want it to never open again, you have to click on the settings button here, and then you've got this one Photoshop launches, do not automatically or automatically open the selected tool. I forgot to tell you that part. Okay, ColorFX Pro with the elephant, and we're going into one of these contrast ones. Uh, detail extractor, there it is. Okay, detail extractor. We're gonna look at the presets for this. And this is just awesome. There's so much good detail in here to pull out on an image like this. And again, the presets in here can help you to really visualize that and see what's in there. We're actually gonna use this image for another detail extractor as well. So I love this. I love, this is an elephant's eye, super close up of an elephant's eye. Um, long lens, don't worry, I wasn't that close. And uh, just, just kind of a cool picture. But, uh, but yeah, this is a great way to pull out some of that detail. You can't use it on skin. You saw it was awful on skin. But for this guy, his skin's all leathery and crunchy, and it just really enhances that. It looks pretty awesome. Uh, Duplex is adding a color shift on top of it. It's just another way of doing that. Um, you can see the color cast on here. You can choose any color that you want on there, and then a variety of ways to, to, to blend that in. I'm realizing we're not going to have enough time to go through all this, uh, so we're not going to go through all of them. Uh, Dynamic Skin Softener. So this is actually a very good one for our model. So let me open her up again go back into that. This one is great for softening the skin. And this is another one where it'll be quite handy to use the, um, the control points. So we are going to look at dynamic skin softener, uh, go into the presets in here. So you can see there's, there's these different presets in here, like entire image softening. is just like this massive softening over the whole thing. Um, strong softening, uh, default and you go, okay, well, it's not that different in here. What, what's going on? Super, super important part of this tool of the dynamic skin softener is choosing the skin color. So this is not assuming a generic skin color. This is asking you to define the skin color of your actual subject. So I go in here and I, you can see the color that's on here, but she's quite pale. Now, <laughs> for those of you who've been watching me for years, um, I've given the kind of speech before about how skin, skin tone, regardless of how light or dark your skin is, we act, it actually is the same color, same color, not identical, but it's very, very lives within a very narrow range of the hue wheel. Um, it is mainly a change of saturation and luminance, but the hue itself is essentially it's a very narrow range of the hue wheel where all human skin tone exists. This selector is not just hue though. This is a very specific color. It's hue, luminance, and chrominance, so HSL. So you do need to pick the actual skin tone on here. So I would click on this little eyedropper click somewhere on her face. And now you see how much it changed when I did that? Suddenly all the softening is being applied to that color range. And so now I can go in here and go, okay, well now it's now it's too much. I can pull this down a little bit. Let's uh, let's blur out, let's say large details. We wanna be pretty blurred out. So any big wrinkles, let's actually zoom in a little bit closer to her face on here. But you can see how totally overdone this is right now. So let's take the, let's actually take all the details down quite a bit. Uh, and start looking for something that looks a little bit more believable. So now we're starting to get to something that looks a little bit better in there. Yeah, it's starting to get there. So here it's, it doesn't take much. Oop, large details and all that, that we definitely want to leave that, leave that up. Nicely smooths out some of the bumps on her skin. Um, and then the small details, that's going to get into that almost Barbie doll plasticky looking, which we want to avoid. So you find the right combination here of small, medium, and large details that you are softening combined by selecting the skin color. And then the color reach in here is an expanded area around that. So if you imagine all the colors laid out flat, how how much of a reach is uh, from that one color that you've selected, is it going to reach out to expand the surrounding area? And then you can combine this all with the control point. So let's say that I want to soften her face, but not her arm. So I could add a control point. We'll just click and add that onto her face on there. And this is one of those examples where I'm probably gonna wanna look at the mask to see what is being actually selected in there. And so we got majority of her face, but part of it's not. So let's go ahead and do that in there. And um, we probably don't have to worry too much about the hair because the colors are so different. But if you really wanted to protect that, we certainly could go in there and start protecting that as well. But it really is not going to be too necessary. Here, the reason I'm doing this is more to protect her arms. So I'm going to want to make this reach a little bit on the smaller side. 
so that we are not, oops, I dropped the opacity on that. That's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Um, so that we are not getting past her face too much. There we go. So now I've isolated it more to her face, hide the masks, and now that smoothing is on her face, but not on her arms. It's a great way to, to go about doing that. All right, uh, film effects. So you have three different film effects. Let me back out of here. There's a four. Uh, it's four. Film effects faded, film effects, get that little preview off there. Film effects faded, film effects modern, nostalgic, and vintage. Faded, nostalgic, and vintage all have these kind of older world of look effects to them, kind of some are a little bit fakey, very kind of Instagram-y, but like Instagram 1.0, it's just a bit overdone, uh, which can be fine, you know, if you want to, to have that kind of old film look to it. But if you're not necessarily trying to do old film, you just want to have film, then that's where you go into the modern, film effects modern. And this is the one where you have an incredible amount of control. We already looked at this a little bit, but I wanted to spend a little bit more time in here because it, it really is very, very good. Uh, you've got all these presets in here. Again, nice starting point. Check out these presets. But look over here on the right. This is this is so impressive. So you've got all these different film stocks, first of all, that are being mimicked. So from you know, old Fuji films, uh, Fuji Chrome films. So there's a Fuji negative, Fuji positives, Kodachrome, Kodak films, and so on. And you start with any one of these that you might like um, or not. You know, just start with one of these. And when you open the film details, you see just how much goes into this. So you have sensitivity for the film. How sensitive is the film to different colors? How sensitive is it to reds and yellows and greens and so on? And for those of you who shot film and anyone who didn't, you may have heard this before. The two most common film stocks would have been like you see in here, Kodak and Fuji. And Kodak the box was red and yellow and Fuji box was green and blue. And that was a hint that those are the colors that the film was more sensitive to. And so Kodak was often used to shoot portraits because the warm skin tones tended to be more enhanced. Fuji was really popular for landscape stuff because the greens and the blues of the sky and the foliage tended to be more enhanced. And you can go in here now digitally and choose your own enhancement, build your own film stock, if you will. You can choose whether you want the film to be more sensitive to red, uh, more sensitive to yellow, greens, and so on. And then you can choose your saturations. Okay, I like the sensitivity, but let's take my sat my reds and desaturate them a little bit, They're a little bit too much. And then you've got a full tone curve. And the tonal curve is really where film, other than the colors, really where film stocks set themselves apart. How did this one re, re, uh, reproduce shadow detail, a highlight detail, the midtones? Did it hold on to the shadows? Did it crush the shadows? All of that can be represented here through a curve, and you can completely customize it, not just to the entire curve, but you can again go in here and do a, a general luma curve, or you can change the red, green, and blue channels independently. So really an extreme amount of control. If you like film looks, I highly encourage you to spend some time playing around in here because there's so much that you can do just with this one. <laughs> now I get a crash board for Photoshop 10 minutes later. Thanks, guys. Uh, Thank you for sending us a crash board. Uh, you, uh, you can really dial in a look that is either very true or just totally your own look. If you ever thought, oh, I wish that I had a film that enhanced the greens and the reds but pulled the blues back, you could build it here. Kind of neat. And then, of course, save that off as a preset. I like it. So I just wanted to show that to you because I think it really is very, very powerful. And it is, I think, one of the most powerful tools that we have in here. Um, 15 minutes left. Let me take a quick look at the questions, see if there's anything else. Nope, nothing else. Again, for those of you watching live, uh, if you have any questions, drop them in at any time. I'll pop the questions open and take a look at what's in there. All right. Uh, let's see here. We're not going to get through all these. So let me let me see what else I want to touch on. I'm going to touch on some of my personal favorites in here instead of trying to go through all of them. Film grain. So this is just film grain. You have film grain inside of the film uh, modern look that we were just in, but you also have a standalone film grain. So if you've if you, all your colors are set the way you want them and you just want to add that grain to it, then this is a place to go. If I, let me zoom in 100% just to show you kind of how this works. You see it says here grain per pixel. It's one of these where if you want less grain, you dial this up to a higher number because it's more grain per pixel, right? If you have fewer grains per pixel, then you're going to have bigger grain, more visible grain. So the more grain is less visible, less grain is more visible. Makes sense, right? So if I take this all the way down to one, then it like every pixel becomes a big old hunk and grain thing. Um, but as I dial this up, you can see the effect that that's going to have. And if you're going to play with this, very important to play with it while you're looking at it 100%. Now, something else I'll throw out there. Let's just say that I was going to do this kind of film look for an Instagram post. What you might want to consider doing is 
doing your color look to the image at full resolution and then exporting out an Instagram sized image or Facebook or Twitter, whatever you're going to do, but a social media sized image. And you can look up online the precise dimensions for Instagram, Twitter and so on. And then open that smaller version up into here and add the grain to it at 100%. Because if I had, let's say I do this and I, I decide this is the grain that I want. By the time I export this out as a much smaller file, that grain look is going to change dramatically. So if you want to really have control over how that's going to look, then you should probably export the picture, bring it back in, open it back up, and um, add the grain to the smaller one. So just a little, little tip in there for you. Uh, let's see here. Foliage. This one's really neat. Let me zoom out of this picture. Actually works fine for this. Uh, this foliage, you can see as I go through the presets in here, the background in there is changing dramatically while her, her face, her hair, completely untouched. So it is identifying not just the green tones, but it's actually intelligently identifying what it believes to be foliage. And, you know, it's not going to always get it right, but in this case, it's done a pretty darn good job of it. So I can make my foliage a bit more warm and green or a bit more yellowy green or a bit more stronger green. And you can see different methods in here that you have to choose from and you can, you have a slider. So if I go to let's say uh, warm green and really crank that up. You can see how much that has changed in the background. But if I do a little before and after on there, she is completely untouched. It's actually pretty remarkable how well that works. Kind of neat. Uh, so that's great. You got a landscape picture with foliage in it. You're trying to pump that up. Um, can be a very good one for that. In fact, let's, let's choose a different picture for this. Um, let's see here. I'm going to use this one here which I believe, yes, I need to do. I'm going to do an auto on here and fix the white balance because this is one where the white balance is all messed up. So for those of you who saw earlier DxO demos that I did, you might recognize this picture. We're going to take that one, open that up like so, and go into Color Effects Pro. And I'm going to use that foliage enhancer in there on this. All right, so foliage, there we go. Uh, I mean, right away, we're seeing it dramatically affecting it. Let's go quite big on there, crank that up, and it really is isolating out that foliage in there. Kind of neat, kind of fun. I dig it. Okay, next picture, next uh, filter. Let's do uh, oh, glamour glow. Well, that means I gotta go back to the girl. Okay, this is the other. Where'd it go? Nope. Where is it? Nope. Ah, where's the picture of the girl? Under here. That one. There she is. All right. Oh, now I do. I have six open now. Can I do? Rearrange. I can. There we go. Now I got my six pictures up. Ah, stop. You zoom out. Okay. Picture of the girl again, and back into Colorfix Pro, and Glamour Glow. Where are we on time? Ten minutes left. Get your questions in. We're gonna be moving fast. All right. Glamour Glow. Here we go. Um, let's actually look at the presets in here. So this is doing some of that softening that we were looking at earlier, but it's Got a little bit of contrast, a little high keying going on. It's basically a glam look that is a bunch of other effects combined into one. So if you're looking to take that wedding photo, for example, and just add that instant glow and high key look and a little bit of extra saturation and so on, you've got it all here in one. And I, I, I kind of like this. I mean, it's a, maybe it's a little bit overdone, but I kind of like it. You know, strong glow on here works really well. It just really blurs out the the features on her face to make them all nice and soft and glowy. Um, we still have all the detail in her eye and in her hair and so on. And that's just a neat effect. I like it. Um, I'm going to go, I want to do, uh, where is it? Um, oh, incidentally, pro contrast. I want to, I do want to show you this one. I mentioned this earlier. Pro contrast really important because you have in here something called dynamic contrast, which this isn't really the right photo for it, but I just want to explain it. Dynamic contrast doesn't add contrast to the entire image equally. It kind of intelligently analyzes the image and adds more contrast into certain areas over others. And it can be a very effective way to add contrast to an image with a single slider that is not overbearing. So if you're if you're looking at a photo and you feel like it just needs more contrast, but a contrast slider is way overdone, then consider the pro contrast. Do do give that one a shot. Um, all right, there was one that I wanted to show. That, oh, here, this one, Midnight. Okay, so Midnight is a filter that will, the idea is to make it look like it was shot at night. And this can actually work remarkably well even on photos that were shot in the middle of the day. But the reason I'm pulling this one up now is to emphasize that a lot of these filters, things like the high key filter, the midnight filter, uh, and so on, 
work best on images that were already shot that way. They work best enhancing an effect that you already did as opposed to trying to take a picture of the shot at high noon and make it look, look like it was shot at midnight. I mean, that's, you know, that's a bit of a stretch, right? But if you took a picture that you shot at night and you want to make it look more night-ish, then that can, this can be a very good tool for that. If you shot something high key, meaning it was very bright and kind of high contrast in the, in the bright areas and very airy and light, and you want to make it even more high key, then the high key filter can be very good for that. If you take a picture that was shot low key and add a high key filter to it, it's not going to suddenly magically turn it into high key. So just keep that in mind. The filters, a lot of these filters are designed to enhance an existing effect as opposed to just magically create an effect out of nowhere. So for that midnight one, I want to use this picture here of uh, the Tokyo skyline. And this one is obviously shot at night already, but when I add this midnight effect to it, it's going to really enhance that even more. So uh, where was that? Midnight. There we go. Let's add this in there. Now this, this preset's a little bit much, but you go through and check out some of these different presets in here, and it really does add that darkness, that richness, but pulls the colors in. Like maybe this is a little bit, a little bit uh, too high contrast in there. Add a little bit more color in. Um, like, oh, here's an example where it's made it too dark, so I want to add a little brightness. So let's add a new filter. Go back into my favorites. Um, dark and light, no, not center. Uh, where's the one that I want? We'll use levels and curves, basic levels and curves. Let me add this before, because I want my levels and curves to happen before the midnighty effect. And I'm going to take my mid-tones up a little bit. There we go. I don't want my highlights to get too high. So it's just those darker areas that I want. Let's protect that. It's kind of darker shadows. I want to pull up a little bit. There we go. There we go. And now maybe I can go back into my midnight, add some of that color saturation back into it. There we go. Cool. So it, again, it's there to enhance the effect. Okay. Let me see what's going on in the chat room here. See if there's any other questions in here and move on. Kate says, what file formats can you save the image in? Okay. So, so that's a great question because it highlights how these work that I didn't go over in the beginning. These are their plugins. They, they can work as standalone apps. You, you can go in and launch it. Like if I go into my apps folder in here, um, Let's see, if I go into the apps folder and I look for the knit collection, if it ever loads, uh, they they do work as miniature apps, but if you open one of these, here we go, knit collection. If I open any one of these, the app has no menu bar. There's no open dialogue. There's no save dialogue. The only way to open an image in the app directly is to drag and drop it onto it, which means when you hit OK down here, all it's doing is saving back to the format that it was in. They're really designed to be used as plugins. So when you're in, for example, in Photoshop here, once I create this effect, so let me go ahead and do this. I'll, I'll hit apply on here. It's going to save this back to Photoshop. I'm still in a Photoshop space. I can now save this out as whatever I want. I can save it out as a JPEG or a TIFF or a PNG or whatever I need in here. If I was starting with an image like a JPEG and I drag that onto the plugin, uh, then it would just say back as a JPEG. If I'm working in um, PhotoLab, for example, I would be opening it as a TIFF file because that's how it renders out the image to open into the plugin as a TIFF. But then you can save it out to whatever you want. Important to know that it will not read any raw files. The plugins themselves don't read raw files. So you have to do a raw decode somewhere else first, which is why you would start start by using either Photoshop or Lightroom or um, Photo Lab, which it comes with, right? So you've got Photo Lab here that the Knit Collection 2 comes with. That becomes your raw processing engine, and then you send it off as a TIFF file to the plugin. And that's automatic. You just click the button, it renders out a TIFF, and it opens it up. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, let's see. There was another one in here. Julie says, very informative. Thanks, Julie from the UK. Thank you, Julie in the UK. I'm glad you enjoyed that. We have five minutes left. Um, nobody shouted out any type of a particular look, so now's your chance to do that. Do you have a particular look that you would love to see me try to create? And I will give that a shot. Um, and while I'm waiting for that to come up, let's see here. I will choose, let's just go back into this picture again. And oops, see if there's anything else I can do that I, that I want to show you quickly. Ooh. Sunlight, another one that I've marked up as a favorite here. is quite nice. The sunlight one will add very much a bright sunny day type of a look to a picture. So here I've added it to this picture here. If I go back to the original, you've seen it already, but there's the original there. It's added this nice kiss of sunlight. It's almost like it was shot at golden arrow. We've got that nice little light in there. Uh, and let's see, maybe take the brightness up even more. 
a little bit warmer in there, bring the color saturation up a little bit. And you go, okay, I like that, but the background is too bright. I need the background to be darker. Great, let's add another filter in here. Go into levels and curves. I wanna add the levels and curves before the filter. And I want to darken the background. So I'm gonna darken the whole image. Let's see here, darken the whole image like that. There we go. And then I'm going to add control points to protect parts of the image. Um, so I could either, either add a control point to add it only to the foliage, or I could add a control point to protect her skin tones. Adding only to the foliage is probably gonna be more effective. Uh, let's try it. I'll click on the plus, go back here, click on there to add that to the foliage in the background in there. And um, yeah, that's working out pretty well. We can make that nice and big. We can always preview that to see exactly what area we are affecting. Nice, okay, it is getting her quite a bit, so let's go ahead and protect her hair. And a very quick way to do this is just you add one and then option drag to add others. Oh yeah, look, it's got all the tattoos on her arm. We don't want that to happen. We don't want those all to get darkened as well. A little bit complicated for the masking because of the different colorings and the tattoos, but, but that's okay. That's okay. And this doesn't have to be perfect. We're not trying to build a perfect mask in here. We're just trying to protect her skins in general. Let's get her eyes on there. And I'm gonna call that good enough. Close that out. And there we go. And let's see here. I am now darkening, largely darkening just the background there. You can see the difference there as I change that effect. Darkening just the background. So I wanted that glow, that light to be on her, but not on the background in there. Pretty good. I kind of like it. Okay. Into the questions. Anything else? There we go. Carol says, I would love to see the fog effect. Okay. Fog effect. Let's add that to, um, let's add it to this picture, actually. I'm kind of gonna, this picture like really, it was kind of awful. Let me do, I forgot how I did this one originally. It actually worked out pretty well. Um, just trying to get the right, this is a photo for those of you who haven't seen this picture before. I've used this one in previous demos. Um, I shot it massively the wrong right, wrong white balance. I really have no idea how I did that, but I did. Uh, all right, there we go, that's pretty good. Let's take that in and let's add fog to this. Now, I believe, if I remember correctly, there's two different fogs. There's a standard fog and a gradient fog, I think. Fog and, yeah, there's fog and graduated fog. So if I just look at fog, it's adding it to the whole thing, which can be a bit overbearing. Like it doesn't really feel very believable. It's just this kind of whitewash over the whole thing. But if we look at graduated fog, there we go, graduated fog, now it can make a bit more sense because the fog can increase off in the distance there. So there is a subtle one that works actually quite well for this picture. So you can see a nice subtle fog in the background. If we do a, let's do a side by side before and after, you can see how that looks in there. And that actually looks pretty effective. So, and that's just that one preset without even playing with it at all. So that graduated fog is usually gonna look much more believable, like much more realistic than the flat out over the whole image fog. Um, see how something let's try that if I go to the default one how yeah yeah like that's too much let's take that down a little bit uh, maybe 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 you can get away with that yeah, so kind of cool and you can rotate it if you know you wanted it the other way around the fogs in the foreground instead of the background for whatever reason um that works too there you go excellent uh let's see here anything else nope that's it and it is it is on the hour on the money. So thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in today. I hope that you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. This was a unique session. This session will never be repeated. I'm doing, uh, well, there are like 20 or so of these sessions happening. I'm doing half of them. Um, I'm not doing these again, I think, until the very end of this month. And then I'm doing a ton of them in August, or maybe they're all in August. I don't remember. But, uh, but if you go to the DXO webinar page, you will see that. In fact, let's just, I'm not even sure what the URL is. Um, Let's see if I can find it real quick, dxo.com. Same link that you used before, I'm sure, but uh, let's see here. If we go, uh, is it popping up here, Nick Collection? Uh, um, maybe we should go to the Nick page, learn more on the Nick page. Here we go, Nick Webinars, there we go. There's the pop-up right here. So go to the Nick nickcollection.dxo.com. I do not want notifications. <laughs> Click on that, and here you go. These are also, this is the one, Dan Hughes is doing one. Oh, there's mine, that's what we're watching right now. Uh, and there's a bunch of them coming up and you can see they're all different. And this is, this is a short list of them. Um, interesting that there's not more listed here, but there's a ton of them coming. So hmm, interesting that there's not more listed already. Well, anyway, keep coming back to this page because there's a lot scheduled through August. Thanks a bunch everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed something. Hope you learned something and, um, 
And if you have any questions, hey, if you have any questions after this you think of, feel free to hit me on social media. I'm Photo Joseph everywhere uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Feel free to, to hit me anywhere there. Um, do a public at on Twitter and I will respond there. Also my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash photo Joseph. Subscribe there, hit the bell if you haven't already subscribed. I do tons of videos on YouTube and uh, that's also a good place to ask questions. Just drop a comment on any video there. With that said, thanks a bunch everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.